Good morning. My name is Brian Widener. I'm an assistant professor of music education at Butler University. And I'm delighted that uh, on this early morning, uh, a couple weeks into the school year, you've selected to spend your time uh, with me talking about how we can take these weird and wonderful or not so wonderful experiences of the past year, year and a half, and make our classrooms better because of it. Um, I think for all of us, it becomes really easy to look back on our past year and a half experiences of COVID uh, with absolute disdain, never wanting to see our students in a uh, Brady Bunch uh, frame spread across, uh, never wanting to look at videos of cat butts and puppy noses in the middle of one of our music classes, uh, never wanting to hear the words, hey, can you hear me now? Am I there? Oh, I, I think you're frozen, maybe. Um, and fighting to figure out all the different ways um, that we can interpret for our students what's happening on our screens. Um, I, again, perhaps just speak for me, but I'm going to assume not, have plenty of words that we never want to ever hear again. And unfortunately, we may be hearing more of these as we look at the current news. Um, but you know, words that we never knew before, such as social distancing, uh, Zooming, and the idea of hybrid teaching have become common parlance for us. Um, these are things that we're going to want to store away. Um, I hope we never need them again, um, but to have there if we need to use them. But today's session um, is talking about something completely different. Um, this is not about what we want to forget about, what we want to leave off to the, uh, the wayside, um, but rather, what are the benefits of this past year? What are the surprises that we found, um, either in lessons that we had forgotten about, in experiences that maybe we hadn't really investigated before? Um, what are the disruptions and the interruptions to normal that when we look back, we go, well, maybe that wasn't so bad. So over the past several months, as I've sat down and worked with my graduate students, as I've worked with uh, teachers in the area, one of the questions that I've regularly asked is, I realize that we never want to repeat 2020, 2021 again, but has there been anything good that's happened in the past year that you're gonna wanna keep? And um, as we get this presentation started, I would ask you to use the chat and um, include that over in our chat here as a starting point for our discussion today. What from the past year, year and a half, is something that when you look back was beneficial for your students, was beneficial for you, that brought a different way of viewing music, that brought a different way of viewing teaching, that brought a different view of learning, that when you think about it, you go, well, maybe that wasn't such a bad thing after all. And what would happen if that stayed in what I do? So as I've talked with these, um, with now dozens of teachers, um, a couple of common themes have come up and we're gonna investigate each of these. Um, now, as you look over these, I don't think you're gonna find them as a surprise. Um, we know that our ensembles are social spaces in which our students not only find music, but find each other. We know that there is a world that exists outside of performance. We know that we wanna build a sense of independence for our students. We know that one of the goals of our programs is that music happens not only within the walls of our classrooms, but across a student's life. And we know that for ourselves to be successful, we need to find work-life balance. We can't be work all the time and still be successful at the end of the day. Um, but I think what COVID has provided us is a disruption to that experience. The regular old normal, well, I have to do it this way because that's the way we've always done it. It's forced us to think about music and music education and our own classrooms and ourselves in a way that maybe we haven't done in a long time. Um, so I wanna use our time this morning to investigate how those explorations and discoveries um, impacted teachers along the way, but also how we might use those into the future to make our classrooms a new or a better new normal. So when we think about our classrooms as ensemble spaces, we know that our students identify themselves by the ensembles they're in. We have the choir kids, the band geeks, the orc dorks. Students crave the community of our classroom. And it's not a surprise that many of our students start music because their best friend did, because that kid that they kind of like across the room did, because there is something social about that experience. 
What COVID taught many of us, and I say this uh, from my own perspective as well, is that the incidental engagements that we have with students, the ones that happen at the beginning and end of class, when they walk by us in the hallway, when they bump into us at the grocery store, are just as important as the intentional ones. That the relationships that we build within our classrooms are the ones that sustain our students socially and emotionally, as well as musically and academically. Um, throughout COVID, we found that students craved not just the music classroom, not just the music learning, um, but the opportunity to share their music with one another, the opportunity to be silly and goofy with one another, to take five minutes of being in class and share the strangest thing that they'd done or take the tour of the house or introduce their pet. Um, I heard over and over again about uh, programs where students were doing birthday drive-bys of one another, um, including drive-bys of their director's house on their birthdays, of asking for that individual attention that the teacher gives of scheduled trivia nights and movie nights where they could just be together again, of the need for virtual concerts, not because it was about proving musical excellence, but because it was about sharing an experience. So as we return back to the classroom, um, I've asked, well, how do you capture that as you return back? And a few things came to the surface. One is to recognize explicitly that our students are in our classrooms because they belong there. There is a culture that they need to have there. Oftentimes, I, and I will say this from my own experience, we've allowed that culture building to happen accidentally. Um, it's a, a byproduct of what we do rather than an intention. Um, and what I heard the teachers say over and over again is that their intention is to put students first in the center of that classroom, to recognize that there is a need to develop a unique culture with a unique language, um, which even in a masked classroom um, can still be built that we need to provide space for students to explicitly form those relationships, um, utilizing mentorship uh, systems, utilizing that time before and after class to allow students to engage with one another, not musically, but socially, and to look for options to intentionally bring every student into that culture, um, recognizing the need that our students need to not just be in a class, but they need to be part. They need to be an orc dork or a band geek or a choir kid. Um, another thing that came forward was um, that in that digital space, students came to rely on each other a lot, especially when technology might have failed. Um, the classes where there was a student who attended via text with another student because their internet connection fell through. Uh, they couldn't get on Zoom anymore, but they could still text back and forth. That need to turn to the neighbor down the street and share experiences yelling across the road. Um, so as we head back into the classroom, as we create this new normal, can we create spaces where we not only allow, but encourage students to engage and support one another? Um, this requires us to allow for a certain amount of chatter in our spaces, um, to allow for students to turn to one another and say, wow, you did that really well. Let me help you. Let me show you how to work your way through this. Do we encourage those relationships to form or is it all one directional with eyes focusing towards the podium? Um, that necessity for peer encouragement is something that has always naturally happened. But do we provide that space in our classroom or is it something that only happens before class and in the practice room? Last but not least, um, many, of our many of the teachers I spoke to realized, uh, again, what they already knew, um, but it came to the forefront of the fact that their classroom is the student's safe space. Um, when we're in online settings, there was the need to create that connection of, if you need something, I am here for you. How do we continue to create that explicitly in our classrooms when we return? Um, we have a pretty divided student body right now. Some who are fearful of being back and want masks on and social distancing. Others who just want to return the way it was when they were freshmen. Do we have that opportunity for students to talk about their own experiences? to be able to justify those and create a space around them that is reflective of them. Uh, for many of the teachers, they talked about the fact that at the beginning of the year, they create classroom rules that everyone shares. But oftentimes those classroom rules just get posted on the wall and that's it. Do we allow that opportunity for students to continue to engage, to continue to say, this isn't working for me. I need something different in this classroom. Um, so I heard teachers talk about putting a comment box at the front of the room, of creating student councils, uh, within their music programs to be able to provide student input of making their classroom space more representative of the students who are there. 
Do the students see their homes within the classroom? Do the students see their families and do they see their identity there? In the same way that we were able to see as we looked at the, the bedroom that was behind them in their um, lessons when they were in digital spaces. As uh, we saw in the assignments they submitted when we said, I need you to engage with the larger world. Um, the general message that came from the teachers I spoke with was that as they head back into the classroom this year, they want to make sure that they don't just allow the ensemble to be a social, a social space by accident, but rather they intentionally infuse that into each and every lesson. Another general theme that I saw from teachers in talking about their experiences of virtual, hybrid, remote learning um, was that pretty much out of necessity, because they weren't able to perform as well, um, they found themselves teaching areas of music that oftentimes fell by the wayside in their bands, choirs, and orchestras. These were issues of composition, history, theory, culture studies, connections to families. Um, asking students to look beyond just the notes they were playing and come to truly understand the music. Particularly as many of them returned back to the classroom this past uh, spring, in the spring of 2021, they noted the huge impact that those background studies, that comprehensive musicianship, had on their students' learning. Um, the students were more excited about the music they were doing, partially because they were able to do it together, but partially because they now understood that music to a higher degree. They understood what the piece of music was about. They understood how it was constructed. They could see through the notes and start understanding the piece itself. And they vowed that that is something that they want to bring into their classroom as they continue forward. One of the common themes was looking at the fact that for many of them, again, because they weren't able to perform, they did a lot more work of looking at the background of the pieces, studying um, as a group uh, professional and collegiate performances of works, coming to understand who the composers are, what their justifications were. Um, two of my favorite stories, um, one from a middle school and one from a high school, we're um, looking at um, David Holsinger's On a Hymn Song of Philip Bliss and Markowski's uh, City Trees. And both of them had used these pieces before in their classrooms. And it noted that the students had always performed them well. But by understanding the story behind them, that um, Hymn Song of Philip Bliss is a song of uh, both death, but also hope for something better. That Markowski's um, City Trees is about being able to find yourself and find confidence in the hardest of times. These messages resonated with students, and particularly in pieces that are slower, more expressive, they're oftentimes harder to sell to the students. These became some of the favorite pieces the students worked on because they truly understood it. So ways that we can go about this is before we hand out that piece of music and say, first rehearsal, let's go. Do we provide the students opportunities for guided listening um, and guided learning? Anticipation guides are a great strategy for this. Providing students with some guidelines that they need to figure out what is the tempo, what is the style, what is the history behind this piece, what are the major changes? Um, by doing these things, students understood the pieces better, it promoted their personal practice, and it created a connection between the students and the works they studied in a way that teachers oftentimes had not previously seen. Composition activities were another common area of investigation for teachers. In many cases, this was the first time teachers had ever taught composition, and they found themselves a little bit in the weeds of, how do I even go about this? Do my students understand this? And what I heard over and over again is that we had made composition into something that is really hard and really difficult and um, takes a lot of time and effort. But what they found was that we can do small scale composition and that by doing that, students found their own voice and they also started paying more attention to the music they were studying because they saw compositional devices. They were able to see sequencing. They were able to identify phrasing. They could hear harmonic function in ways they couldn't before. Um, so for many of these teachers, they talked about building in a short composition period into every class or once a week where students had to create music. In some cases, that's creation based on variation. So let's take the melody we're working with and what are the different ways that we could reinterpret it. In others, it was about starting with a concept and creating towards that concept. But their focus has become on short, quick composition, allowing students the opportunities to see themselves as creators and to be able to connect their creations to the music they're doing. Composition isn't about hitting pause and saying, and now we go compose for a week. But rather, it can be about, we're going to take five minutes and everyone is going to create something that expresses their mood of the day. And then being able to I, take that apart 
and understand that this piece is sad and slow, that this piece is excited and anxious. And what are the characteristics of that that allow that to happen? And now let's go to our music. And what do we see in our performances? It enriched the student learning and made sure that not only did they see themselves as capable of performing, but also capable of creating. A third area that many teachers engaged in, um, again, quite out of necessity, was having students reflect on their own practices. In many cases, teachers found that their students lacked the ability um, to really submit quality recordings. So the role of reflecting on their performance fell largely on the students in the classroom. And this was through a variety of means. Record a video of yourself talking about your practice. Um, engage in an online forum where we discuss um, a recording that we have cobbled together with one another. Uh, reflect on a peer's performance and give them feedback. But the teachers again talked about the importance that this had when they came back together in the classroom. Their students were more critically aware of the music they were making. They saw themselves as able to not only make music, but correct music. It increased their critical understanding and importantly moved the students in a direction of having more effective individual practice. It opened up a realm of musicianship that the students hadn't encountered before. And that transitions us to kind of the third set of concepts um, that I saw in many of these teachers. Uh, as I'm sure you experienced in your own classroom, by having students in remote settings, it very intentionally made it that our students became independent musicians. And I heard over and over again about teachers stating how much they came to realize that they structured their students' learning, that they didn't necessarily provide the students all the tools that they needed to have in order to be independent musicians. Uh, and they very much vowed that surprise after finding out that their students can do it, that they need to provide their students that opportunity and that space to be able to make music on their own. A critical piece in this was teaching the specific strategies for individual practice. Many teachers made short videos uh, that demonstrate um, how to use strategies like chunking, tempo alteration, uh, simplification, so that students could use those in their own practice. Students then created videos of their practice times. They gave commentary on them. And through that, teachers are able to see their students progress and their ability to be critical musicians. Once students have those skills and those strategies, they're able to use them. And I heard teachers over and over again talk about how they intend to infuse practice strategy instruction into their daily lessons. So that it's not just, I expect you to go home and practice, but rather you now have the tools to effectively practice. Um, similar to what we heard um, in um, the last category around comprehensive musicianship, there was a renewed interest for many of these teachers in promoting critical self-assessment. And this was built um, on a pattern of really four principles. Um, first of all, can students diagnose, or sorry, identify that they've even made a mistake? Um, that process of identification is really key and critical. And in many cases, they found that their students couldn't even identify they were playing parts wrong. They need to be taught about that identification. Next, can they uh, describe what actually happened? When they made a mistake, what were the factors that came into play? Third, then, were you able to diagnose what those problems were? Why did I make that mistake? Why did I come in early? Why did the pitch come out a shelf too high? And that led them to solutions the students could use. This pattern of identification, description, diagnosis, and solution, IDS, I-D-D-S, has become a foundation for many teachers. They're now going to become part of what they do in practice. So while on the podium, rather than telling students that it was wrong, taking that extra moment to go, I heard something at measure 38. Can you tell me what it is that you heard? What exactly happened there? Why did it happen that way? Well, how can we fix it? And they found that by going through this, even over the sh relatively short period that we had of really chaotic teaching online, our students became more critical and they want to sustain that as they move forward. For many classrooms, as they came back together, it wasn't practical to have full ensembles together, but they found ways to do small group music making, uh, whether that's chamber ensembles, sectionals, um, ragtag um, large ensembles that were made up of seven to 10 players. And what they found was that the level of independence that students developed was really important. No longer was there a section of 10 clarinets all working together with one who really knew it and nine who followed, but every student now was specifically responsible for their learning. And I heard teachers talk about that desire to bring more small group learning into their practice. A key part of this is allowing students to take risks, to take stumbles, to fail, and to be able to recover. 
the fact that there are authentic opportunities for students to problem solve their music, that we as teachers take one step back and say, you know what, I'm going to let you struggle for a little bit. I'm going to let you ask the first question rather than jumping in and telling them that, that there's a need to uh, change something. This need to allow students to make music with others is a critical step in this process of independent musicianship. And I heard over and over again how teachers were rather shocked that when they brought their entire ensemble back together for a May concert, the ensemble wasn't as weak as they would have thought with the limited amount of practice together. And a key part of it was the fact that they had, come to be, they had become self-reliant in their music making. We want to move our students towards that. In many of the classrooms that I looked at, um, in the search for how do we still create music performance opportunities, how do we still have students be actively musically engaged, um, I heard teachers talk about creative activities that had students going and performing um, concerts for grandma and grandpa over Zoom, sitting out on their front steps and in one really touching story, having entire neighborhoods playing concerts together, of engaging with families, making music together, in multi-generational settings. And I heard so many of them talk about how excited their students came in to learn that their parents were musical, to learn that there were family stories related with music that had never been uncovered because we had never bothered to ask. As we head back into the classroom this year, they vowed to make sure that what happens outside of school, the life-wide experience of music making, took a more prominent space in their classrooms than it had previously, where the music tended to be teacher-selected, teacher-directed, um, and very academically focused. So one thing that many of these teachers talked about was engaging the families in their communities more strongly. Um, in some cases, these are really simple things. We're gonna send home a survey and ask parents what they believe is most important for their students' musical education. What is the music that happens in your household? What are important songs? And then bringing those into their classrooms. Um, they saw the impact of asking the student to sing a song or play a recording that was important to them and having them talk about it and wanting to harness those moments. The benefit with this is that many found that because parents were for the first time seeing their students engage with music in academic ways, their parents were able to support the students even more, even if they weren't musical themselves, because they heard the little snippets of, you know what, I heard that you're having problems with that music. Slow it down. Let's just look at a little chunk of it. Okay, so what's your problem? They talked about the fact that they had parents who were emulating the same teaching practices that they used themselves in their classroom. So by bringing families into the classroom, it made the families were more capable to help support the student learning outside of the classroom. Community performance took on a completely different face for many schools during the pandemic. In many cases, this involved a virtual con concerts, something that I hope we don't utter again, at least in my experience, anytime soon. Uh, but in many cases, we also found that these community performances became really diverse. Um, one teacher that I spoke with told her students to go and find a space outside to perform. Um, and the students were shocked that they'd be performing in a park under a tree um, out in front of their house. And in one case, taking their flute to the zoo and playing for the animals and having people just stop and watch them. The impact that it made for a seventh grader to have community members who wanted to listen to them, people that they didn't know coming up and congratulating them for a strong performance. Can we find ways to make our community performances more informal? Can we make it that the people that we're performing for aren't just friends, families, and supporters, but the community at large? What are those opportunities that we have to make music and share music with another human being? Um, and can we broaden our definition of what a community performance is from the patriotic performance for Veterans Day um, or the community event, uh, but instead find small ways to bring music into our communities to make sure that people understand that music is important and likewise for our students to understand that the music that they make is impactful and important. A final piece that came in this idea of lifelong music making was again in the sense of, well, I can't perform as a band, an orchestra, or a choir via Zoom. How can we still create music? And this was opening up opportunities for students to find new venues for music making and new ways to make music. I heard over and over again uh, about classrooms that, involved, that engaged online programs like Flipgrid or even TikTok to create videos that the students could share with one another. 
um, that exhibited not just their classical Western art tradition trained skills, but involved the students making music in all sorts of different ways. Um, in my own classrooms, I had students who started to explore um, with electronic musicianship um, without guidance, just seeing what would happen when I put X, Y, and Z together. Um, I saw videos submitted to me by some of my graduate students of their students creating ensembles with found objects, creating music all new. Are there opportunities for us to encourage our students to experiment with music, to recognize that music making isn't just about playing the right notes at the right times? but that it can extend beyond that and involve the exploration of music, of making noisy and joyful mistakes. Do we provide opportunities in our classroom where our students aren't required to play just the right notes, but are expected to create sounds that maybe we haven't found before? Um, in many of the classrooms, I heard about the fact that we're having Creativity Fridays or composition um, and improvisation activities that'll, that encourage and expect students to not use their instruments in traditional ways. And whether that's using additional instruments, additional sounds, or just creating sounds on their instruments um, using non-standard practices, it's become important for our students to see that there isn't a single right way to make music, that all of their music is honored and celebrated, and that there's an opportunity to bring that in. So up until now, my conversation has almost entirely been around the experience of the students but I think the most resonant aspect that I heard from every single teacher was how disruptive COVID was to understanding work-life balance. For all of the teachers that I talked with, the issue of work-life balance um, was certainly a critical element across the entire uh, COVID pandemic. Um, initially, uh, I think, and I will speak on my own behalf here as well, we were all absolutely overwhelmed, trying to figure out just how do we continue to teach our classes, to support our students, and find a peace of mind for ourselves. I know as I taught uh, from my dining room table, um, the line between life and work became really thin, literally a wall. And I oftentimes found myself drifting from one to the other as my own children needed support and as my students needed support. And I found myself on all the time. As we became more uh, familiar with pan the pandemic life, one of the things that I heard many of the teachers talk about was this very kind of eureka moment where they realized that the balance of how things had been working perhaps wasn't the healthiest for them across time. Um, for many of them, I heard about the lack of comp competitions, the lack of extracurriculars, lack of extra committee meetings, weekends and nights being a really jarring moment for them as they realized exactly how much time their job was taking. Now, I'm also going to say that for many, as those elements came back, they celebrated the opportunity back with their students. They celebrated the opportunity to have something that felt like performative music, to have something that was about sharing that music again. Um, but for all of them, I heard them talking about how there was a real desire to reconsider what is most important to make sure that they're weighing out what the needs of their students actually are versus their own personal needs. Um, and coming to recognize that not only is it possible, but it's necessary to create space in our lives for ourselves. Um, and I just want to reiterate the importance of that as we return to a new and hopefully better normal, that we don't just fall back into that trap of, well, I'm on for 110 hours a week and that's just the way it's going to be but we seriously consider what is it that we're doing and who does it impact? So one of the common themes that came up across COVID and now as we head back into classrooms, um, I continue to hear is this need to create boundaries. Um, when we're teaching remotely and home was work and work was home, it was explicitly necessary to set those boundaries just so that we still had a space. But as we return back to perhaps more clearly delineated lines, school happens in the building, home happens at home, we need to make sure that we're creating spaces for ourselves. Um, and I mean ourselves, not as teachers, but as human beings. Do we ensure that we have the opportunity to care for ourselves, three meals a day, a good night's sleep, and time to engage in the things that rejuvenate us? And once we've made those boundaries, do we protect them ferociously? Do we make sure that when we say, this Saturday night is mine, we don't all of a sudden fall back into that trap and go, except for I'm gonna do some grading, I'll check those playing tests, and oh yeah, I'll just run in and make some quick copies. 
We've all been culprit of that at some point or another. And I think COVID has demonstrated to us the importance of not just having great work experiences, but having some balance within our life where we can spend time with those we care about and we love doing the things that we care about and love. Along those same lines, um, I want to reiterate the need that I heard over and over again that we need to find time to shut down. And that shutdown may look completely different. Uh, for one person, it may be spending an hour with Netflix. For another, it may be doing a five mile run. But that need to be able to find time for yourself not only is critical for our own welfare, but it makes us better teachers. What I heard over and over again from teachers this past spring as we returned back to the classroom in still demanding situations was the demonstrable difference that came when they went and shut down for a moment and allowed themselves to put school aside, to close the laptop, to put the school bag under the desk and remember what it meant to be a person. Um, that when they returned back to their classroom, they were more effective, they were more energized. And this intentional scheduling is something that isn't a luxury, but a necessity to be an effective teacher. The trade-off in this is recognizing that doing more is not always better. Um, in this case, I am the pot calling the kettle black because I am absolutely aware of the fact that there are plenty of things I do in my own job that don't make anyone's life easier. It's more work for me and my students don't benefit from it. But it's that feeling of, well, I should do this. I should make that a little bit better because maybe someone will care. We need to do a careful reconsideration of the activities we do, of the functions that we engage with, and ask what is actually important here? What is actually necessary? What is, am I doing that doesn't actually impact anyone's education, anyone's experience, but I'm doing because it's the window dressing, because it feels like I should do it? Can we eliminate some of the things that aren't necessary for us to be effective teachers and effective musicians, and instead use that time to the betterment of our students and use that time to the sustaining welfare of ourselves. Um, there is plenty that we do in our jobs that we do because we've always done it that way. And if we can recognize, recognize those moments that we're doing more just because we're doing more, our students are gonna benefit and importantly, we are going to benefit in our own lives. So I would welcome you to continue this conversation um, forward. Um, over in the chat, um, as I encouraged at the very beginning, what did you learn from the pandemic that is now going to become part of your practice? Um, along the same lines, please also let me know, um, either through the chat here or uh, via email, are there things that I can do to help you be a more successful teacher? Our mission here at Butler University is to support music education in all its forms, in all its ways. If there are ways that we can be a service to you, please reach out, um, particularly as we return back to the better new normal. We want to make sure that we emphasize not just normal and not just new, but better. How do we take it somewhere different? Um, I also want to encourage you as we need to uh, open up this channel for others uh, that I will be over on a Zoom uh, link. You can see it down at the bottom of the screen. I'll also drop it over in the chat um, so that we can continue this conversation offline. Uh, this morning, if there are things that you would like um, to share about your experiences that I can share with others, or if there are ways that we can help you, we'd love to have that conversation. Thank you again for joining me. I wish you the best of luck as you head into what will hopefully be a musically, educationally, and personally gratifying 2021, 2022. And I hope to see all of you very soon. Have a good morning.